any public participation this evening? Yeah, yeah. Down and back. It's on the agenda. It's on the agenda. You are looking at getting somebody. It's on the agenda tonight. Okay. Yeah. Sure that, you know, it's on the agenda tonight. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Tinker. I'm just here. I'm wondering, I guess we're addressing the same issues we've addressed over and over before. Why we're making rules to eliminate kids from playing sports. I, I don't, I, for the life of me, I can't figure out what's going on. We play in the small school league for a reason, because we don't have numbers, right? We, we're we now limited in 7th and 8th grade for <coughs> junior high teams, and we can't field teams. I mean, that's, that should be obvious, just so obvious to everybody involved. We can't field teams with two grades. It's not going to happen. So we're basically eliminating, and we're not willing to play by the, the league rules, obviously. We just form our own teams with other town kids when there's kids in Lubeck that want to play. And I don't understand why we're telling Lubeck kids no, they can't play on a team and letting out of, out of town kids. We're not even attempting anymore to field a Lubeck junior high team with Lubeck kids. Not even attempting it. And I don't understand it. It's dry, it drives me crazy. I, I have supported these this athletic, I've supported these teams, I've supported these kids over and over and over again. I just don't understand why we're, we're right back. We discussed this once in 2017 at a board meeting. They said the kids were playing too many games. We went from 29 games to 24 games. We've now dropped down to a lot less than that. The Pee Wee schedule is eight games this year, eight. That's what it is. It's not like they're playing 200 games. They play in eight games and the junior high schedule is 12 games. And I just, I don't understand why we're making rules to, to prevent kids from playing. We should be encouraging them to play. I don't understand that for the life of me. Okay. I have one comment to make on that. Last year, we reformulated the athletic handbook. We did. Okay. And there are some pretty hard and fast ages, not ages, but grades where kids can play and so on like that. Mm -hmm. The ultimate say-so with the athletic handbook comes down to either the principal or the athletic director. And in this case here, I'm going to go with the athletic director, what the athletic director wants to do, because he's the professional. I'm not. Okay? The board kind of puts the rules in place yeah. on how we operate and the guidelines in place on how we operate. Okay? And then it's up to the professionals to bring that out to the school. And I know Mr. Ashby has done a great job with what's going on with the school, with both athletic directing and being the gym, gym teacher and health teacher and so on like that. And he has, I think, over 21, 22 years of experience 31. in athletics. And I believe he does have, have a degree in a little bit more than I do as far as in kinesiology and what goes on in, you know, there's a lot of aspects of, of players and teams and so on like that. So. I mean, the last call comes down to what the athletic director is going to put in place and what kind of rules he's going to, you know, kind of abide by for the safety of the kids. Now, as far as changing rules in the middle of the stream, apparently that's been done in the past where people have allowed younger kids or whatever to play on teams. And I can't go for that because we put in place as the board, and this was last year's board, we reformulated yeah. that whole book. Okay, we put these rules in place. Right. And we can't change those just because something else changes in the middle of the stream. We, it just can't be done. Okay. So, yes. um, I'm going to basically go with, you know, what, what the athletic director wants to do and the principal wants to do because this is the rules we put in place. Okay. So if we're going to follow the rules, we, I was a part of making that handbook. I was in that. I, was, I know you were. I was involved in that. I know. And the handbook is clear that junior high basketball is five, six, seven, and eight. That's the handbook that we passed. It's clear. So if we're going to go by that, when are we going to go? When we're going to pick and choose when we're going to go? What do I tell a kid that breaks the rule? 
Well, we're going to go by it here. We ain't gonna, I, don't, I don't know anymore when to use the handbook, when to not use the handbook. The, the handbook, I have put to, all that I have to defer to the athletic director in this case because he's the professional here. I'm not. Okay. And the members of the board are not. Do we have an athletic director? As far as I know, we, we have an athletic director, yeah. Well, I'm not sure because he messaged me and told me that he resigned. I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't know. This is what I'm being told. Yeah. Unless yeah. that was just a lie. I, mean. I have a written. It's going to be. I was going to add it to my report. I have a written notice of resignation from Mr. Ashby, indicating his intent to resign his position as athletic director only. Mm -hmm. I have spoken to Mr. Ashby about this. Um, both Tina and I did. I'm in a position where I can accept his resignation. However, if this board feels strongly, you can ask either Tina or myself to follow up with Mr. Ashby and see if he will reconsider. But I do have his written written resignation with me this evening. His prerogative to do so. Yes. I don't know what to tell you. So now we are. We don't have an athletic director, so what about the handbook? We don't. We pick and choose when we're going to follow that. We, I, I just want to. I just want to say something. The first day of school, I was at the school, and I was there for one reason: to help Mr. Ashby, to give him the contact. I let him use my email to get in out of it all season long. I give him all the, all the contacts that he needed to. And the first day of school, I was called aside, and Miss Wormel told me that this was what she wanted to do. And Mr. Ashby had no, had nothing to do with that. This was the first day of school. He isn't even involved in any of this yet. And I told her then, I disagreed. I said, I don't believe this will work, not with the size of our classes. We have three fifth graders. When these kids are seventh and eighth graders, how are you going to be able to teach? How is that going to be possible? I mean, it ought to be so obvious to the people that are there that we are not going to be able to field teams this way. It's but not going to, this change is not going to work. In, in fairness to Mr. Ashby, who's not here, um, I followed up with him regarding this matter, and I and, and, and I, was, I would say to the group that, that Sean called me on the phone, and I, and I heard uh, what, what he had to say. Mr. Ashby compiled some research that, that we had here this evening uh, that shows the sixth graders in particular would be exposed to 66 games not counting practices. And Mr. Ashby made that analysis based on Pee Wee 5th and 6th, the eligibility of 6th graders to compete on 7th and 8th grade junior high ball teams, as well as their opportunity to compete on the travel team, the all-star team. It is Mr. Ashby's opinion that this number of games is excessive, and in his opinion, uh, comprises a risk to the student safety. That is, that is his opinion, that is what he shared with both Tina and myself. Uh, I do have Mr. Ashby's resignation here this evening as athletic director only, but since he is not here, I feel compelled to say that he did, his decision was not made haphazardly, and he feels that his decision reflects what is in the best interest of students. Now, obviously, uh, there's a difference of opinion, he recognizes that, and it is his intent not to be confrontational. Mm -hmm. I would also point out to the group what we already know, Mr. Ashby is an alumnus of Lubeck, recently moved back, and, and is seeking to contribute to his community. Uh, so, you know, with that, uh, obviously we have a difference of opinion here. Uh, for my board, I want to reassure all of you that both Peter and I have spoken with Mr. Ashby. Uh, he has provided some documentation that I forward to all of you. And I have some, I have some few copies here, I think it's really interesting. But uh, that is what is behind his decision. He and he and Mr. Tinker disagree on this particular topic, but that is what is behind his decision. Wonderful. There are so little things, and this is what I maintain about it, there are so little things that our kids have access to. Their main thing, do they play 66 games a year? I mean, we're, they're coming up with these numbers, but all our kids have is sport. Now, eventually, uh, it is, like in 2017, 
the parents spoke, and I said a lot down at that game. But eventually, this school has got to make the kids be first and have, like with sports, there's no kids that play 66 games. And like one of you people just said, team has already made up her mind. They're not doing it as the, that we've done in the past. So you're sending a message to our students. Uh, it says in there that five, six, seven, eight. I know there's you two. You were there at that meeting. I know there's two kids that are in. Three. Uh, three, but there's three that are playing peewee. What's up with that? Are they good enough to play on the middle school team? I mean, what? What the middle school team? We don't have one. I mean, I, we don't have a legit. Our kids don't even have the opportunity to have legitimate uh, leagues. And well, I, I mean, I, I need to ask. I need to ask a clarified question. Did we not just go play a game last night at Pembroke with our middle school team? We did with four boys. Okay. Four boys that we had. When we had three more from Lubeck that wanted to play, we had four boys. One from Lubeck. Yeah. The rest from Campbell and White. And that time, place okay. with issues, we did make, not feel comfortable. It's safe in the going handbook, to though, that these kids are supposed to play on their great team. And they're on the Pee Wee team. Now, yeah. who makes that kind of decision? Does, do we have a copy of the handbook with us? Yes. Okay. So, I'm, I'm going. I'm going from memory, but is it not? Does it not say in the handbook that Pee Wee is the grades three to six, junior high is seven and eight? No, junior high is five, five, six, five, six seven, eight. and eight. Yeah. That's clear. So it, somebody it made a decision yeah. to bump these kids down. Well, from based on my conversation <laughs> with Mr. Ashby, it is he did make the decision. He owns that decision. He's comfortable with that decision. <coughs> on the well, you know who is the Mr. Johnson? Our teacher. And our parents. And our coaches. Okay. So. Is that the athletic handbook there? We weren't happy. Our child was not, couldn't play right here. At the uh, last Pee Wee game right. that was home, not tonight, because obviously I'm not down there. Uh, I asked one of the boys that played last year. It was in the second grade this year, in the third. I asked him why he was. Ah, he's ready for the game tonight. Well, I thought he was going to stop crying. He says, I can't play this year. What do you mean? What happened? He said, they're not going to allow us to play. He played last year. Now, those those young kids, they don't have no 66 school. They don't have. Well, actually, they have zero. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how, many, how, many, how many games How many games did Pee Wee play? What's Eight. Eight. Junior high, 20? 12. 12. And how many on travel days? 12. 12 and 12 is 24. 8 will get you to 32. So that's the final idea. Yeah, but what do you do with third grade? Hey, let's look at let's <laughs> let's just look at this. Okay, yeah. let's talk about other sports okay. because volleyball, cross country, and soccer all do it once. Mr. Ashby took down the fourth grade in soccer, and that was fine. But what are we going to do when they're playing? When we have kids that play volleyball, we can't. We're a small. We can't field all these teams unless. We let the kids play. Okay. So we can't field a volleyball, a cross country, and a soccer team at the same time, which their sports are all at the same time, unless we let these kids play. Okay. So we're eliminating sports, is what we're really doing. Right, a couple, couple, couple things. I'm, I'm reading from page seven. It says this is this is in your uh, this is in your athletic code. It says miscellaneous team policies. All the rules, regulations, and policies are subject to change with notice by the athletic director and principal, as approved by the school committee. So, Mr. Ashby did not exceed his authority by making a decision. This is as approved by the school committee, yeah. not that you guys? This, this document is approved by the school committee. Right. Those are so, the rules that we set in place. Right? Yeah, yeah. The other thing that I would say is, and this, and this came up in my conversation with Mr. Ashby, and I'm, I'm taking a little liberty here, but I don't believe he would mind if I shared this information. Your comment, Sean, that it was your belief that you know, what about other sports, that you felt the athletic code would be implemented differently for other sports, and you noted that Mr. Ashby was the soccer coach, and that's true this past year. And in speaking with Mr. Ashby, we talked about this, um, a couple things would, 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 would jump out immediately. Uh, the first one being, if you're looking at the number of games the soccer season, and typically fewer games than basketball, and you also play on grass compared to the hard surface of the court. So a one-to-one -one comparison, you know, wouldn't, 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 be, wouldn't be entirely accurate. So the other thing that I would say is this, 
and, and this is where the school committee is going to come into play where it says in your code as approved by the school committee. Um, you have an administrator in the form of Mr. Ashby who feels that this is a safety issue. As a, any school sponsored event, the school department is responsible for what's loosely referred to as a reasonable level of safety. Now, when parents sign the athletic code, give them permission for their son or daughter to play, they are accepting a reasonable level of risk. Where you can twist your ankle playing basketball, you can get kicked playing soccer, that's within the normal flow of the sport, that's reasonable. Game schedule, how many games you play, how many do you let kids play, you are responsible for those decisions as well. And you may have parents like Mr. Tinker and, and like Mr. Sartell and Mrs. Sartell and I understand they want their children to play as much. And, and I played a lot. You might surmise, as tall as I am, I like playing basketball. As a board, you're responsible for the safety, the reasonable safety of those students in a school-sponsored event. Fast forward, if we have a student that played 24, 32 games repeatedly, grade 7, grade 8, if they can't play in grade 9, because they have tendonitis, shin splints, fill in the blank, the same parent who wanted their child to play 24, 32 games a year can come to you and say, you shouldn't have let my child play those games, you were negligent because now they can't play in high school. That may be an extreme example to illustrate a point, and no, I don't know of a case where that's happened. But my point to my board is, you are still responsible for a reasonable level of safety, and you can't delegate that. So Mr. Ashby feels uh, differently than Mr. Tinker and Mr. Sartell do on this issue. My role as superintendent is only to remind this board of what your responsibility is. And I would say this for the group. Mr. Ashby, I believe, is firmly committed to supporting those kids. And I wouldn't want anything that is said here tonight to suggest that he doesn't support the kids in the back that was part of his whole philosophy and moving back to town and taking the job. And we may have a difference of opinion on this issue, and yes, I've got his resignation. But I have to say that I feel the man is sincere. And I had never met Mr. Ashby prior to this year, but I have to say I feel the man is sincere. I feel that he does care about the kids in New Bat. If we disagree on this particular issue and we end up moving forward with a different athletic director, I just wouldn't want Mr. Ashby to be characterized as, as somebody who didn't care. Because I, I just don't think that's well, true. Well, to be clear, I'm not saying that I don't agree with Mr. Ashby because I haven't talked to him. Okay. So Sorry. I've known Billy. He was a coach of mine when I was in high school. Okay, well, we didn't get Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, we, we Billy don't want to Bill was in my, Bill was in my class. He was, I could still consider him a good friend. Yeah. I still yeah. consider him a good friend. That doesn't mean he has all the answers. And I kind of, and now I'm sitting here wondering, and asking myself, and I'm asking the board, are we now being held hostage? If I don't get my way, I'm res resigning, but if I do, I'm not. Is that where we are? Because I'm not sure. I, I, this is what I'm hearing. No, I don't think, I don't think that's his intention. Right? No, I, I hope not. not. I hope, I, I, you know, and I don't think and it is either, but I'm asking the question, because it sounds I, like it. Now. I would actually look at him because he is the professional here. I mean, I've done a lot of research in this area, too, and what they're talking about is repetitive sports. They're talking about baseball pitchers and football. He has done this for his career. He is the professional <coughs> here. And I've done this, too, as a volunteer okay. for, year, for 10 years, and I've never, never yeah. had these injuries that you're talking about. And I know that's not his intention to do that. So how are we going to field teams now? With, two, with seventh and eighth grade, how are we going to field any teams, Mike? I don't know. We're not. I don't know. We have three kids in fifth grade. How are we going to feel that there's more team? kids in town? I don't know what to tell you, Sean. I really well, don't you know. Well, you know what? Somebody's you. dream's going to come true. We're not going to have sport. Right. And somebody, that's what I feel somebody wants, and that's what's going to happen. Okay. Let's. So that's. Okay. That's it. That's and you know what? Okay. You guys are just saying, and I respect Mr. Ashby, but Me you're too. saying these coaches are indifferent to patients. I mean, to us. Uh, the kids' safety. It's They've not. had a year after didn't year. Say that, didn't say that. In, Sean. Wanda, Wanda, what? you're out of a line. I'm sorry. Yeah. I did not say that at all. It was not intended to be said that way and wasn't inferred that way at all. And okay? I respect well, what I'm saying, What I'm saying here is that Mr. Ashby 
has done this his whole professional career. He's the professional that I would say, we can, we can agree to disagree, Sean, okay? This is what he's done for his career. With adults. This is no, what with he, adults. This can is, we agree on John, that? This is what he's done for his career, I'm sorry. With adults. Can we agree on that? We can agree to disagree that, yeah, okay. So with adults, but you know what? Okay, thank you. He knows about children, too. Okay. And so do I. Okay. So we can agree to disagree on this. He's the professional. He, up until the board says, yeah, okay, we, we accept his resignation, which I encourage you and you to talk to him, okay, as a board member. I can poll the rest of the board on that if you'd like. But he's the professional that I defer to on this here. That's all I have to say on that. So, you, so. I mean, we're, we're not going to be able to field teams. That's the bottom line. I mean, just, that's what you're saying. We can't field teams with two classes. Please don't put, please don't put words in my mouth, Mr. Thinker. Are we going with 7th and 8th grade for junior high sports only? I'm referring to the athletic director. So does this, is this just basketball? Is this soccer? Is this, uh, are we going to mix it? I don't know what to tell kids. Can you play? Can't you play? You tell them they can. You give them uniforms, then you take them away and make them cry. I don't know. What are we supposed to tell them? It was that way. It was, I, I mean, kind of need to time. know. I am a coach. I kind of <clears> need <throat> to, you know, when the pit, when there's parents complaining, and it's been happening. As a coach, do you years. report to the athletic director? Of course. If we have one, but he's told me he resigned, so, so where do I go now? Where, where, who do I report to now, Mike? The board, the board has asked either Tina or myself to follow up with No one today. board member has. I, I can poll the board to that. I'm going to poll the board. Oh, what would you like the principal and the superintendent to do? I think encourage Mr. Asprey, or just accept his resignation? Your choice. I believe it's up to him. And you guys can talk to him, but it's up to him. He's an adult. Well, yeah, ultimately, but I think... Mm -hmm. well, yeah, yeah, the choice is up to his, but I would like the superintendent and the principal to talk to him. So. I do have a question in regards to this. Can't, as a parent and a school board member, my daughter played all through the sports for three different years, four different years, I believe, actually. Um, can't we as parents accept responsibility if our children want to play the numerous different sports and keep it as we had it, you know, junior high, five through eight, the peewee, and allow okay. the coaches so, to pick up or drop down? And so, when I, so, so when I said to the board that this board can't delegate its responsibility for, <coughs> for student safety, and and I, apologize, and, and I apologize to the group because many times I have to use an extreme example to illustrate a point. So, and I'm going to have to again here as well. If if there were if there were athletic boosters, you know, in, in some towns, you know, athletic boosters in Bangor is a big deal. Believe me, you could have you could have an extremely <coughs> an extremely convincing group of parents, a group of boosters, and they cannot take on responsibility in a school-sponsored event. Now, I realize here, and it's becoming more common around the county, it's not just here. The county. We weekend tournaments, rec tournaments, there was one in Calus here a couple weekends ago, Caribou came down, this is a lot of things, I'm sure it was a great event. Parents can take their kids if they so desire, and I'm sure some did. School-sponsored event is, is a different animal, and the board cannot delegate its responsibility for a reasonable level of safety. And I'll, I'll, use a, I'll, use an ex, I'll use an extreme example. If you have a college level athlete that all of a sudden sustains a serious injury or you, and they lose a scholarship or something, a parent can say, your athletic director was negligible, I didn't know the risks, I didn't understand the consequences, I'm not an expert, your athletic director has worked at the college level, has a degree and whatever, I, sh I should have been told. Because a parent doesn't have that same level of expectation. Now, I don't want to diminish the role of parents because any parent here, you do have responsibility over your own child. As a board, as a school department, we have responsibility for the group in a school-sponsored event. 
So it, 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 it's kind of a jurisdictional issue, and the example that I used is an extreme example because it's one in it's, it's one in a hundred thousand that actually has a college level athlete, and that's kind of an extreme example. But it goes back to what has been said before. Uh, there's a difference of opinion here, and Mr. Ashby has a different opinion than, than some of our coaches and some of our parents. But this, and, and this board is is, 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 is going to direct Tina or I to, to take some action, but I don't want to dismiss Mr. Ashby's concerns over safety either. I see. Go ahead, Mr. So if our boys team now is school, a school-sponsored event, now we ha are we now responsible for kids from all over the county that play for? Are we is that now a, a school sponsored event? If you, if, you have, no? if you have a junior high schedule, what do you say? Twelve games. Yeah. Okay, that's a school sponsored event. You bet. So we're now yeah. responsible for kids yeah. from Camp Abella. You have a school school sponsored event. It gets a little gray <coughs> when you go if you take the kids from Camp Abella because they don't attend our school. It's not gray as far as your athletic code goes, because this is also past practice. We've had kids from Camp Bellow play with us before when we can't field team, and yes, we know that league rules say if you use kids from another school, you have to forfeit those games. And it's, right. it, it's unfortunate, and I, I've been told in some cases we wouldn't even let the game be played. Right. They won't come play it. And that's, to me, that's a, that, that's a league rule that, that should be changed and whatever. But. Well, how about we play by the league rules? We are in the league. Well, you is, can want to change them all is, you want. That is, you're a, that is, that is, you should that is, play by that the rules. Rule. And whether or not the other towns, and I was told that Pembroke lets the younger kids play on that team, that's a decision for Pembroke. That's a different town. They can have a different policy if they want. Can I use an example? Please do. I'll use an extreme example. No, I'll use a real example. We played Pembroke the other night. Yep. Pembroke scored five points in the first quarter, and then our boys' team shut them out, and they never scored another point the entire game because we don't have any young kids to put in. We're playing seventh and eighth graders against third graders and fourth graders, and and we're the big bad bullies now. It's not right. It's not you know we should be concerned about their kids as well, not just our all couple home kids. Now we're the big bad bullies. We're pounding up on other schools. No wonder they don't want to play us. Who wants to sign up for that? I think I think there are some other solutions to that issue that could be explored. There are. There are. Well, I I would like you to suggest some because I was there and, and we. You know. Well, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one example. I, I know this one firsthand. East Fork can't field team. So they have a couple of kids that would love to play. I'm sure. But they can't feel the team. They didn't have a junior high team last year. They don't have one this one on the board side. Theoretically, to me, it would be in the realm of possibility to have a combined eSport Pembroke team. Maybe you can have enough 7th and 8th graders put together where you can that's going to play their 7th and 8th graders with Campobello. You play a combined team, everybody's of the same age bracket. There's a, there's a different solution. I don't know if it'll fly. You know it won't fly. We already know that. No? Not in the league. The league rules don't allow it. I mean, how would it fly? You can't. You got to play by the rules. You got to have to fork it all there. Well. Well, do they still get their full stipend on oh. these games if they're supposed to play X amount? The coaches? Yeah. No, that's all. The, the all style is all voluntary. We do that every year. That's just all strictly voluntary. The, 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 the coaches sign a stipend. We issue that stipend in good faith. They'll be paid the stipend. If they play eight games with. Six, six games? Yeah. The stipend is for the activity. The activity concludes when the schedule of the season is over. We issue that stipend in good faith, they sign in good faith, we pay. Okay, the remaining two board members that can answer. Would you like the superintendent and the principal to ask Mr. Ashby to reconsider? Yes or no? Well, I really don't have an opinion on this one because if you wanted to reconsider, would that be his decision? <coughs> it's ultimately his decision. Yeah, he knows he has the option to reconsider okay. if he wanted to come forward. Well, 
Consider approval of February 28, 2019 school committee minutes as written with corrections are as recommended by the superintendent of schools. <coughs> I'll move to approve this. I'll second it. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay, principal's report. Systems of Maine has been down. Um, I spoke with them yesterday on the phone. As soon as the managers get together and come up with an estimate, they will email that to me. Security cameras, um, Seacoast Security has been down. They've given a quote. Mr. Fielding was down the other day, but I've not received a quote. And I just wanted to remind you that Seacoast Security's quote expires on the 18th. Uh, Donors Choose, which is a program that people can write into, teachers can write into to get things. Uh, Mrs. Bagley has been funded for a non-refrigerated -refri wall water cooler, um, which is a device where students can refill their water bottles, keep track of the number of bottles they're not throwing out, recycling, that type of thing. Um, on March 9th, staff attended school on a Saturday to swap out the workshop day. We spent the day doing Fred Jones Tools for Teaching, the professional activity, uh, development activity that we continue to work on, and we also completed the security training for the Empower Me Tester. March 15th, report cards go home. On the 20th, Island Readers and Writers will have an author visit. On the 18th, Empower Me, which is the MEA testing begins. And on the 27th is our fine seg final segment of Growth Mindset with Mrs. Street, myself, and Ms. Mitchell. <coughs> and that is my report. <coughs> school committee, anyone on the school committee have anything? Superintendent's report. A couple of quick items. Uh, you've heard me reference state report cards in the past. I received a call a few days ago from Chelsea Fulton in the Department of Education who indicated that the United States Department of Education had requested additional information from the state of Maine on their school improvement plan at the federal level. As a result, those state report cards, as well as uh, any type of coaching, school improvement activities, uh, have been put on hold indefinitely by the commissioner while they consult uh, with their legal services and the attorney general's office what their options are. So the feds basically have put the state on hold, so we are all on hold. Uh, I've already shared uh, our receipt of uh, Mr. Ashby's resignation as athletic director. Uh, last thing in my report for this evening, at last night's AOS meeting, uh, the budget was adopted and an AOS referendum vote scheduled for April 11th, 6 o'clock, in Charlotte. Now that's all I have in my report for this evening. 
Okay, adjustments to the agenda. I do not have any. Old business. The new business to consider discussion of an attendance policy. So I pulled together um, what we currently have. And then this last one is a blank, it's a um, one that has not been approved that Helen sent down. There was a sample from um, the school manager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one out of uh, MSA B15, we just adopted last year. This current one that we have, this is in the student handbook. This is in the student handbook, yes. This is from 2006. This one here on compulsory attendance, that was adopted in 2008. Okay. So there's actually, since 2008, um, and this is not really public record, this is something I brought along from uh, my own research on this. Um, there's been an update on that. And it's still considered you know, the same thing, compulsory school attendance, JEA, but there's been some additions on there. Um, and what I'll do is I'll probably direct this to you, Mr. Superintendent, maybe on the next meeting we can give this out or disperse this, because this is the updated version of this. Okay. And this comes from main school management. Yep. So, um, The big changes they put in here with the, the new one, it has uh, adult responsibility for school attendance, exceptions, um, it gives examples of exceptions, uh, alternatives to attendance to public school, and so on and so forth. And then it refers and cross-references um, drop, dropout prevention committee, truancy, and homeschooling. Um, and this is, uh, like I said, from main school management. This, this document here. So, and then along with um, compulsory school attendance is the truancy policy and uh, reporting child abuse and neglect, and they go all, they all go hand in hand. So, they're all cross-referenced in the same document. So, um, so it is a couple examples and so on like that. And we can probably table this for the next meeting. I would like to have that done, and actually, we can disperse this at the next meeting. I'll send you a copy of that on email. Okay. On that's that's the newest one out. That uh, was adopted last year, right? Actually, right about this date. So. I'll get a motion and a vote to table that till the next meeting. Okay. So the motion on the floor is to. Uh, Table the attendance policy until we get the updated version um, distributed by main school management on the next meeting. I'll move this. Okay. All in favor? Okay. <coughs> Mr. 
consider discussion on the anti-bullying presentation. This is the anti-bullying presentation we discussed at the last meeting with, um, what's the gentleman's name? Michael, Michael Chase. Yeah. Michael Chase, yes. Yeah. So, as I talked about at the last meeting, he only looked at grades four and up. Um, there was input from the audience that they thought it would be better to go, if we could go lower. Uh, so I have reached out to two people. Um, one is a Tom Steenland. He will do a K2, a 3, 4, and a 5, 8. Um, the cost for that is $5,000. Mm. He will be in Milford, Maine on September 5th. Then I reached out to a Randy Jackson. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Back, what, September 5th? Yes. That's the earliest he could do this? When I sent the email asking when are you available, okay. he said we'll be in Milford September 5th. Does that work for you? Well, I haven't responded. Just down the road. Then I reached out to Randy Judkins, who we have had here before. He will do a K-4, a 5-8, and then a follow-up with 7th and 8th graders um, for $1,400 plus travel. His closest date is our last day of school. So I guess my question is, October, and as we talked about last time, it's getting late to try to find people. October is National Bullying Prevention Month. Do we want to tie something together? from the board. Nobody can do it in the bathroom? These are the people that I've, that I've talked to, um, that, I've, that I've emailed. That was three. And the other gentleman we talked about, he only does six, seven, and eight? It was four through, four through, <coughs> one, four through three, <coughs> four through three, was it fourth grade through, I'm thinking fourth grade through, through high four, school. Three, two, eight, yeah. Eight. But these two went down low. Has anybody contacted the state bullying board? I know there's a bullying um, uh, a, a person at the state. Sarah. Yeah. yeah. Do they have? Yeah. They do mm -hmm. they have a lot of resources? Can we go? They 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 would they would probably have a list of people like this. There's got to be more than three, right? I'm not sure there are. East Fort mm -hmm. had somebody come up from. Uh, North Carolina, the gentleman in semi retirement last year. And, uh, David? David? Yeah. It would be nice to get something in this school year. Definitely. Yeah. Not out somewhere the last day of school. Mr. Chairman, some of the stuff recently happened that's been in the paper in your main, you know, it's really serious and, uh, now that this is all coming out with papers and everything, it'd be good to, where it, it's fresh with everybody, get on board with the kids and try to do something, in my opinion. And then we could ask that person about the uh, DEA Department of Education. I know Sarah, I just don't give her a good touch with her. They have any more resources other than that? We can see what is available. It would be nice to get something this school year. Yeah. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. another couple months to go. I asked about this like over a month ago. Yeah. You know, I came. I've had two weeks and right on top of it. You know, oh, yeah, I'm not. I can, I'm not. I can reach out to Sarah. Um, if so, if like. we could. Boy, do you have direction on that? We have a motion on that to have uh, Tina look into that? Yes, I'm going to say. Consider the first reading of revised policy JLF reporting child abuse, neglect JLF R reporting child abuse, neglect administration <laughs> procedure and policy JLF E suspected child abuse neglect report form. Not one at a time. Okay, you are in. Wow. Yeah, you're critiquing my methodology well, no, of distributing. Said, it, it was said to me, don't pass them up with them. <laughs> That's okay. Now, is this, the, is this the original one or the... No, this is the revised one. The revised one, okay. We have a copy of the original one. <coughs> Three copies, if the board would like. So as that finds its way around, uh, we have visited this once before, but there have been some changes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to call your attention to language right on page one 
Uh, and it does say under uh, Section 2, Paragraph A, uh, any employee of school unit who has reason to suspect that a child has been or is likely to be abused or neglected must immediately notify the building principal. <coughs> And it goes on to say, you know, there's a time frame here where a report has to be made, and I, I won't read that specifically uh, here. All of you uh, can take this policy with you for action next time. But the point that I want to make is this. If for some reason, if I am at a conference and Tina is in a meeting, all school employees are mandated reporters. Any one of them can pick up the phone and report to the Department of Human Services. And it is only our obligation to report. Um, school officials uh, can be asked for information if they've done an investigation that may shed some light on information, but ultimately our responsibility is to report and the Department of Human Services will conduct an investigation. We do not make a determination of true or false, guilt or innocence, A or B. Our obligation is to report. And the biggest thing that I stress to all of the employees, uh, don't wait in reporting because if you had reasonable suspicion to believe a child was at risk and you delayed in reporting and something happened in the meantime, that could be a tragedy. So that's the point that I make to all the staff. Uh, if you want to dig into the policy, a couple other things <coughs> I want to point out. If you look on page three where it says interviews of child and school personnel. Uh, this one has gotten to be more commonly understood, but I always emphasize a couple of points here as well. If we look under Section 5, and I would also uh, generally emphasize this particular section, it is allowable for the Department of Human Services to come to school and conduct an interview on the school premises, school personnel are not required to notify the parents. So I just need to make sure everybody understands that it's here in the policy in black and white. It does say, Section D, that school, school personnel provide an appropriate, quiet, and private place for the interview. And it, it says down here, uh, not to disclose any information about DHHS's intention to interview the child except the school officials or the school's attorney who need the information to comply with the interview request. Who is not listed in that paragraph? Parents. Last one I'll say before I ask for a vote to accept uh, first reading. Section 7, right on the bottom of page 3, good faith immunity. I always make sure I emphasize this point, especially with school staff. Any person who in good faith reports assists DHHS in making a child available for an interview or participates in the investigation or proceeding of a child protection investigation is immune from any criminal or civil liability for the act of reporting or participating. Good faith does not include instances when a false report is made and the person knows the report is false. So just a point of emphasis there. Okay. I, I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I've got a copy of the current one that we've adopted right. back in 2016, and in some of these paragraphs, there is no change there at all. So what are we, what are we looking at here? Even though it is italicized, yep. I see nothing in the verbiage that's different. And I believe in the new one, there's a, an actual form attached. Do we have a form attached yeah. in the old policy? That be, well, not on this one here, on the procedure, Administrative procedure there is a form attached to it. And then there's, I believe the new one has JLF slash E. JLF and JLF and JLF slash R. Therein, therein lies the change. No. And it, it says uh, this form is for school use only. It is not to be sent to DHHS, which I find to be interesting. But. Yeah. Well, the question I have on this is. Uh, <coughs> You know, they talk about, you know, when to report and so on like that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes in, is, there is a part <coughs> where, where it comes into where they're talking about truancy and so on like that. I would think a policy like this here would be rolled out with the changes with the new attendance policy and the new truancy policy that we're going to be putting in place. Just my thought on that. The other question I had on this here is that... Um,
maybe I'm not reading it right, but if I'm looking at um, the administration procedure here, and I understand that, you know, look, if you're not around, or the principal's not around, or the assistant principal's not around, that, you know, you're still our amended reporter, I mean, is there still a chain of command that has to be followed on a case where, you know, it's not imminent danger to the child. The child doesn't have bruises or marks all over the body, and maybe it is has, has to do with, you know, not coming to school, you know, regularly or something like that. Is there an administration procedure like in the truancy policy? I don't believe there's a procedure atta attached to the truancy policy. Although, it, as you pointed out, the policy has changed, and truancy is defined in the law. There's actually a truancy report right. uh, that uh, that I have to certify quarterly, I believe. Well, truancy procedure, and, and, and the reason I'm getting at this because you know they kind of go hand in hand because in, in some cases you know you're going to be calling you know DHSS for this you know. And on the truancy policy, I see frequent communications between teacher and family, changes in the learning environment, mentoring, student counseling, tutoring, placement, you know, attendance contracts, uh, referral to other agencies, uh, interviewing with the, you know, superintendent and so on like that. So, um, so I'm wondering why all of a sudden we're going to be changing this and not rolling it out with the attendance and truancy policy. We can we, we can roll it out together if you want, but there, there would still be two separate policies. So, uh, I mean, we still have we still have one in place right now, yep. but not the updated version. Right. And like I said, other than that, the reporting form on the back, that's the only difference I see. Right. So. Well, the difference I see is in Revenue Rule Section Two. Mm -hmm. um, it's clear that if um, there isn't confirmation from the principal that this information has been received and reported, the employee is required, shall notify the HHS. That's in B, it's in C. Um, again, in lower number on number three, there's requirements. That's, I think, part of the reason why you have the good faith community, which we also have right. in the world. Because you have to do this. You can't say, well, I told the principal I don't have to do mm -hmm. Right, you have to follow through. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I mean, there, there, is, there is a story behind this policy, and, and it's a sad one. Uh, in my administrative travels and workshops and trainings that I attend, there was a tragedy in the southern part of the state where communication was an issue. Yeah. So if you read this, it's pretty prescriptive. So many times policies are revised after an incident and existing policies in a particular case were less than adequate. Uh, but somewhere in the state there is a tragedy. And that's for immediate danger? No, that's for reporting. It actually, reporting. Yeah, I, think, I believe it actually mm -hmm. says not just immediate danger. Uh, whether you believe a child is has been or is likely to be. So if the language is, is likely to be, I don't think I think that goes beyond immediate danger. It says what paragraph uh, is that? That'd be a. page one, section two, paragraph A. a. Uh, any employee of a school unit who has reason to suspect that a child has been or is likely to be abused or neglected must immediately notify the building principal and the notification that's process. In, that's so. in the present policy we have. Okay. So, but I, I think Stephanie asked me about uh, immediate danger, and I just referenced uh, that phrase, or it's likely to be, because that, that means something different than immediate danger. Why do we need to update this? And updates happen because something happens that we need to update it. Well, was there a mandate by the state? When these policies are updated... Why was this policy chosen to be updated? I as, as I indicated, there was a tragedy where the process and communication was examined. And I don't have the details, obviously. It was highly controversial and highly uh, 
and highly uh, painful from what I've been told. But is it a mandate that you adopt this policy? There isn't a mandate that says you must adopt this policy. However, the risk, if you ever had an incident <coughs> on the board and you didn't follow the policy because you didn't have the updated version on file, that increases your legal liability dramatically. So I don't know if I'd call it a mandate. I would call it strongly suggested. I hope. These all come from main school management. Contact person there is Charlotte Bates. She actually is an attorney. Uh, but I can tell you that our own legal services at Drummond and Woodson maintain duplicate call copies of all policies that come out through MSNA. But it's just a duplicate. What's, it's not just a duplicate. Which one it's a significant it's difference. On the old policy, it says the superintendent should send confirmation. The notifying person should acknowledge. Confirmation at knob should be retained. The new one says shall make an immediate report, shall sign, shall make a verbal, shall make a written report. It's mandatory in the new policy. So you can't say, well, I should have invited him out of here. You know, that's not an option anymore, but that's also why you have the protection of this good faith community, which is also about the whole policy. Do we have a big problem here? We could. No, I'm just wondering if we do. Well, you don't know until it happens. Yeah, I'm for sure. Just looking for a first reading tonight. I move to accept it. I'll second it. All in favor? All opposed? I oppose the report to confirmation. Two to two, two to two is rejecting the first, the first reading. Yes. Okay. <laughs> is that carried, sir? Well, in order for anything to pass, it has to be, there has to be a majority of a quorum. We have, we have a policy in place, <coughs> if I'm looking at it right, I mean, what the old policy that I received from the office over in Eastport, it's the same verbiage. I don't know what you're seeing there. I'm seeing, and I would like to see this whole thing maybe rolled out with the truancy and, and, and attendance policy at the same time. And maybe give us a little more time to look it over. And, Any type of abuse? They can. If I was at the school and I this saw This is the new policy. I'm telling you, yeah. the verbiage is Could very, I report it? It's the same Good. verbiage. Okay. The, uh, the, the private citizen would have the same right to report as any school personnel. The difference is school personnel are mandated reporting. And truthfully, if a private citizen reported that to a school personnel, I would expect school personnel to, to ask a few questions and, and, and make a report. Uh, but the answer is yes. Are they now mandated to report? If the new one had... School personnel are indeed mandated reporters. So I'm saying if it comes from a, just a citizen and reports to a... That's my if I tell a teacher I saw something, then are they mandated to report that? that? Or is that what like you do have to be careful because the mandate, the mandated reporter, there's an element there of what an employee would observe firsthand. Uh, but truthfully, this is this is a gray area. I always encourage staff to err on the side of caution on behalf of the child, and usually that's pretty sad. Okay. Yes, that that, that, that that immunity in practice exists right now. The new the, the proposed policy that was just rejected actually codifies it, which is a change in lingo. But good faith immunity that that exists that exists right now. Okay. One more question for that. So, if a child is being used as a tool for someone being vindictive in which the person reporting, okay. will that immunity if they find that the policy reporting will 
that come true? If it is found that it's false, that say somebody there is pissed off at a parent, yeah. you know, not saying anything, kind of make, just making an example, General. and they use the child as a tool and call Child Protective Service falsely, will their immunity, you know, no. and it will be the, the, taken the, to court. And Aiden is correct. The immunity clause does say that you're not protected from immunity if you know that a report is false. Right. So. Nobody would do that because that's not fair to the child or the parent. You know, and, and if there is abuse, it should be reported. And yes, but I, and on the other hand, it shouldn't be used as a tool to go after a parent because you may have a friend or whatever reason to speak it out or whatever. Well, I would, well, I would hope that would not be the case. Sadly, it does happen. It does happen, unfortunately. Yes, it does. I've seen it, and that's what I want to know. Okay, so we'll revisit this at another time, maybe with the attendance policy and everything. Well, not if you rejected it. We will, if you want to table it, we can revisit it again. We may have to research that one. Okay. Look into it. I'll get back to this. Okay. Consider discussion on the Lubeck School Department proposed budget. So, we just finished before the meeting, the school board meeting. We had a meeting with the budget committee. I want to know where the proposed budget is going. Um, <coughs> any changes from the last one? <laughs> printing. And there's also some uh, input on different things. So, so uh, the obvious question being, you know, what is what has changed between the last board meeting and tonight, one version and uh, the second version. So a couple things I'll call your attention to right on page, right on page one. Up at the top, if we see uh, total local revenue, you can see that the projected savings to the taxpayer has increased to 176,801.97, which is approximately one full mill of taxation here in Lubeck. And the reason for that increase is two things. In the body of the budget that I'll take you through quickly, uh, at the last meeting, we had uh, inadvertently kept in there uh, money to pay your share of a shared nursing position that existed previously. That was removed in the second version because you now have a grant funded nurse, which is a great luxury. No other school in the district has that on site. So we took that money out. That obviously resulted in the savings. Uh, the other thing that was uh, there was one of the cells in the Excel software that wasn't being picked up. So I caught that and directed my staff to make that change, and everything is in order. And I'm happy to say that resulted in more savings as well. So 176,801.97 at the top. That's about one full mill of taxation. You can see your subsidy 240,799.56. Uh, that went down a very modest $610.99. Again, using $150,000 in fund balance forward. Uh, the gross budget, the gray rectangle at the very bottom, your gross budget is down 152. Uh, so all good news on that page. Page two, you can see salary and benefits for our teaching staff along with lines at the bottom for technology, uh, supplies, uh, equipment, uh, and uh, dues and fees and so on. One other thing I'll call your attention to on that page, where it says books and periodicals, we were happy to be able to purchase a new reading curriculum in the fall, uh, but that money has been removed because there's no need to buy it twice, so that line was reduced accordingly. So that's what that savings of $16,500 represents. Uh, that particular cost center, when it's all said and done, saw a reduction of $13,000. Moving on to page three, regular instruction continued. Uh, secondary tuition line. We know that tuition is a major driver in our budget. You can see current enrolled 37. We project 11 graduating and five entering. And that will be a net loss of uh, six, which takes you down to 31. So what that does is you see a significant savings in tuition because you're paying for six fewer students. However, it also means you have six fewer students. Uh, so that kind of cuts both ways. Uh, you can see a note here on the right where it says add one ghost student. That's a question from one of my staffers 
asking the board whether or not they would like to include an extra student in your tuition cost center in case one moves to town, somebody changes residency, comes to live with mom or dad in Lubeck, whatever the case may be, you would be able to accommodate that. Uh, so just looking for a little direction over the course of the next uh, couple of months as we move along. Some towns carry an extra student in their tuition line. Some towns budget the exact number. Uh, it can go either way. Gifted and talented program at the bottom there. And the total cost center for regular instruction down 94000 Again, the vast majority of that due to fewer secondary tuition students. Special education on page four. This particular cost center is down as well. Uh, you'll notice the zeros under EdTech. This particular version does show that with an EdTech position removed. I did bring the exact number to the board tonight. The board uh, collectively expressed their support for uh, putting that back in at the last time, but they did not vote, so I brought the exact number tonight. Uh, and the number is we have seven students identified, five of which receive full-time uh, support in the special education classroom. Uh, should the board still maintain its desire to have that ed tech put back in, I will simply ask the board to vote officially tonight. And that will direct my staff and I to put that back into the budget. We have a motion on that right now. I make the motion that we retain the, the ed tech in special ed. A second on that motion. <coughs> I will second that motion. All in favor? All opposed? Three to two. Three to one. Three to one. Thank you. When I come to our next board meeting, those costs will be in there. If you're curious as to what that would cost for an ed tech, you can look right at the adjacent uh, position here. This particular ed tech is funded through local entitlement, but you can see what the calculation would be for a special education technician in the lower quarter of the salary scale with a single subscription health insurance. Those numbers there collectively add up to about $30,000. So $30,000 essentially will go into your budget, and uh, I thank the board for giving me that clarification. I'll bring those changes with me next time. On page five, the next page, uh, you can see the rest of your special education budget. Uh, you see some costs shifting between elementary and secondary levels, uh, but you still will have two students at day treatment next year. Uh, one is getting older, and the cost center just shifted between elementary and secondary. Uh, so that's what you see going on there. On page six, we see cost centers for extracurricular <coughs> stipends for our coaches and advisors, lines there for officials, general supplies uh, to support extracurriculars. At the bottom, uh, where it says student and staff support health services, that's where the funds for the nurse were removed. Uh, those were no longer necessary. And the $3,500 at the bottom on the student evaluation services uh, for star testing and uh, what was the other one? I excel. I excel. Excuse me. So that 3,500 is for student assessments. Uh, those assessments are required for data collection purposes, both Title I and also to generally inform instruction. On page seven, system administration. You see expenses at the top for school board, board member stipends, uh, lines for your audit, legal services, insurance. Uh, dues and fees and a modest travel line are included in the top section. At the bottom of page 7, under Superintendent of Schools, 101, 17, and 15 cents is the AOS assessment that we recently uh, adopted a uh, district budget. Uh, but that is what Lubeck's AOS assessment uh, will be. Collectively, system administration uh, saw a modest reduction of some $3,000. Uh, and the good news just keeps going on. We're going in the right direction. On page 8, principal's office, you see salary and benefits associated with the principal and the secretary. Down at the bottom, appropriate lines for copier lease, maintenance, uh, phone bill, postage, supplies and maintenance, 
uh, generally speaking, uh, this particular uh, cost center uh, is up uh, $8,000, uh, but this represents, uh, again, pretty responsible budgeting. Uh, one note that you see here on the right, Wicked Good Software, that's a software report that was relocated from regular instruction and moved into school administration because our school secretary uses that software. And it's better organization. If you're wondering why we make such organizational changes, believe it or not, the state is getting more and more surgical about how we report data. It has to go under the right cost center or we'll get a phone call. And they'll make Chad upload it again. It's all fine until Chad gets grumpy. On page 9, transportation of buses, you see a decrease here. Uh, obviously, we have salary and benefits for our bus drivers, but here's where the decrease comes into play. If we recall from the current year, back in the fall, we had the opportunity to apply for a VW grant and had to put in a 20% match for two school buses. Uh, those two school buses, 20% uh, match, is represented on the $40,000 line that you see under the 18-19 school year. We did not get that grant. We did, however, buy a bus the good old-fashioned way through state subsidy. Uh, so we will get subsidized for that purchase. We are paying for the bulk of it locally. Uh, but we made year one payment out of that $40,000. Under the 1920 school year, you will see the payment principal and interest uh, for the second installment on a five-year payout. Uh, so one bus payment is less money than two 20% matches. So I'm happy to say we're passing on a savings of $32,000 in this particular cost center. Coming down the home stretch, facilities maintenance. Here we see cost centers for our custodian, also lines for water, sewer, trash removal, building repairs, uh, fire and security monitoring, uh, insurance, heating fuel, equipment, uh, roof repair, and the HVAC system. And uh, this particular cost center likely will change. Anything you'd like to add to that, Mike? Um, yeah, we're going to have to uh, replace two boilers in the basement of the gymnasium. And we're probably looking at somewhere around the vicinity of $80,000 additional per year, probably over the next seven to ten years to pay for that. So anywhere between $450,000 and $600,000 to replace two boilers. And uh, add um, any type of heat into the uh, gymnasium area and so on like that. So it's just something that has to be done because those two boilers are on their last way. And finally, on page 11, all other expenditures. I frequently get asked in town meetings, what are all other expenditures? Uh, lunch program, uh, we're required to feed them. So uh, students, obviously, uh, they keep eating. I don't mind do. Uh, salary and benefits for our cook and assistant cook also line for food, groceries, uh, and your contingency at the bottom of the page remains the same. Uh, you, and finally, on the last summary page, you can see what cost centers went up, what cost centers went down. You can see that your total gross budget was decreased by 152. So please be advised, uh, we're going to be putting money back into the budget for uh, an ed tech position. And we'll have to put something in there for uh, the HVAC system so we can see what it looks like in the budget. So the next time I come, to a board meeting, this budget will look dramatically different. And, and that being said, on that final figure there, uh, even with those two items being put back into the budget and something like that, we're still at cost savings of probably around $40,000 over the last year. So, and, uh, so the figures will become a little bit more refined over the next month or so. And hopefully, uh, by the end of May, we'll have something that will be finalized this. Just one more, one final word I guess for me uh, would be we will have two more budget workshops at least. We're required to have three minimum and an SAD. We had one this evening at four o'clock. Uh, we will certainly have two more uh, before the year is out. So if any of you are curious about the budget process and want to see that unfold, 
uh, just keep an eye out because we typically piggyback the budget workshops with school committee meetings for convenience. Uh, we met at 4 o'clock here in this very room this afternoon. So if you're interested in that, watch the agendas as they're posted because they typically say meeting at 6 and workshop at 4. So I just uh, throw that out there. Okay. That's it. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was looking it up. Yeah.